turn in your Bibles uh, to Romans chapter 6. If you don't have your Bible, uh, you need to come to the Lord Jesus. And No, it's okay. If you don't have a Bible, somebody next to you has a Bible. But um, open up your Bible, Romans chapter 6. You guys, we're going to read this. This is our last time. We're going to finish it today. Can you believe this? It's a huge chunk. I warned you three weeks ago you couldn't break it up. Today is our last installment of this. We're looking at a message titled, Having a Life Worth Living. And um, it really matters. It, it absolutely matters. Uh, verse 12, I'll begin if you'll pick it up in verse 13. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not, listen, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Are you guys okay? Yes. You're really quiet, you know. You know that. You, you, can, you can read louder if you'd like to. Where, was, where were we? And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and in the end, everlasting life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Awesome. You may be seated, church. We have looked, and now in our third installment of this, these two previous arguments that come out of this portion of Scripture. Uh, an, an argument that the apostle begins and starts in verse 12, and as I said in our introduction a few weeks ago, cannot be broken up. It's a flowing thought. It's something that when you and I, if we were able to be speaking personally to the Apostle Paul, he would have taken a breath and he would have started speaking. And in verse 12, it started that. And he would have then ended his breath right there at the end of verse 23. Paul would have been delivering under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking to the believers in Rome, what God wanted to communicate to us regarding this very key issue of the Christian life. And I understand this morning what I'm about to say. It's kind of a hard sell if you think about it. What the apostle is saying is absolute truth. Do you, do you understand that? This is the Bible that's on your lap. This is God's word. It is not happy thoughts. It's not uh, cheerleading thoughts. It's not um, motivational thoughts. It's the actual word of God. What God is saying, he means. And it's good news for you if you hang on and listen all the way through. Powerful truth. We saw that verses 12 to 14 is that having a life worth living is having a life that's powered by God. You are not to do Christianity on your own. You don't have the power. You don't have the strength. It can only happen by the power of God in the word of God as you yield yourself to God. And we learned that in verses 12, 13, and 14. Secondly, last time together, having a life worth living, we learned this in verses 15 to 19, and that is having the awareness of God's grace. Do you remember I opened up by saying to you that Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great German theologian, if you get a chance, either 
uh, read about him. Uh, Eric Metaxas probably wrote the, the biggest treaty on his life. I mean, it's like that thick. It's massive. Uh, it's a big read. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer, interestingly enough, was a man who would not bow to Hitler's manipulation of the church prior to World War II in its full development. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Adolf Hitler, as he was rising to power, do you know what he saw as a big problem in Germany? The church. So then he began to send his guys out to infiltrate every church that he could in Germany to detect or to figure out which churches would be or quite possibly posed a threat to him starting up his Yes, it's a megalomaniac thought, but he didn't think so. Did you know, you know what the Third Reich means? Anybody know Reich? You know what the Third Reich means? Reich in German is the Third, third Reich, the Third Millennium. Hitler believed that he was going to establish a world without problems, a world under his rule and domain. And oh yeah, the first thing that you do is kill all Jews because what Hitler said is, you gotta kill all the Jews because they're the ones that killed Jesus. So you've gotta wash the earth of Jews. And so he began his campaign and he began, listen up. This is, I don't even know why I'm doing this. It has nothing to do with my notes. <laughs> but let's, let's trust God's working in this. Hitler used something that some of you are aware of and it's making its surface again today. Hitler used the doctrines taught in some churches of replacement theology, that God is done with the Jews, the church took its place, and if you understand that, then Hitler was saying, I'll lead you into a new millennium. And so many churches signed up, and oh, by the way, oh, by the way, as he was coming into power, he told the pastors, you know what, you don't need to be subject to the fragile tithing of your flock any longer. Because you don't know if you're going to eat next week or not, being a pastor. You shouldn't have to put up with that. You know what we're going to do? We're going to pay your wages. The government will send you money as a pastor, and you won't have to do anything but what we tell you to do. Beware when the government sends money to churches because there's going to be a calling card to that giving of money and it's going to be a calling card that's going to say someday, maybe very soon, oh, remember when you collected the money from us during COVID? Well, this is what you're going to say and not going to say or give us the money back. Pastors around the nation ought to read the fine print to the money they accepted. How many, how many pastors signed up for that money that the government, did you, are you guys, you're looking at me like a blank face. Did you know that churches, churches didn't even ask for money and money was sent to them. The government sent us a whopper of a ginormous, humongous seven figure check. I wrote them a dirty letter in the, in the Lord. I mean, <laughs> no, I'll sum it up. I said, if we need your money to preach the word, we got the wrong God. Here's your money back. We need to walk in the awareness of God's grace. God provides, God guides. Chuck Smith always taught us, if you don't know who Chuck Smith is, he's the founder of Calvary Chapel Movement. And Chuck Smith, in fact, we used to joke around, it was called Chuck 1-1. And that is when God guides, God provides. Never will you see the righteous, David said, begging bread. God will provide. And he does that by his grace. And so this section, as we come to this portion of scripture, I'm really excited about this because I don't know how many of you started with us in Romans chapter one, verse one, but if you're here today, congratulations, you survived because with the ending of chapter six, it gets really exciting in chapter seven from here on out all the way to the end. From chapters one to six, Paul is just beating you up one side down the other, smacking you around. And why was he doing that? To see if you're a real believer. Now, after he's kind of cleared out the room, next week we'll start on chapter 7, verse 1, and it's thrilling. 
The Bible tells us, as we've learned in Romans 3, verse 23 and 4, it says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What, a, what an amazing two verses that is. It sets us up for the conclusion of these six chapters. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Translation, nobody can ever be good enough no matter what your morality is. Oh, but I've been a great citizen. Doesn't count. I've kept all the rules. Doesn't count. Oh, especially this one. I've kept the Ten Commandments. You're a liar. <laughs> Let me see. Where's that one out? That shall not lie. Okay, boom, right there. We can, listen, when we come to the Ten Commandments, when we read them, we realize we fail at the first one. We didn't grow up from birth loving God with all of our heart, did we? We grew up loving us. Or more specifically, I grew up loving me. You grew up loving you. No, you can't get to heaven in, in morality. You can't get to heaven by being good enough. We know this. The book of Romans is such a great treaty to announce this. And then in verse 24, he makes this incredible statement because you can hear everybody cry, right? Everybody's crying in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Pastor, you're insulting me. Oh, that hurts. Ouch, that stings. Oh, what? there's no hope. Just read verse 24. Being justified freely, it means it didn't cost you anything. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that grace, don't call it cheap because it's free. Remember, I said this last week. He said, don't call it cheap because it's free. It costs God his life. Being justified freely by his grace through, this is the, the, by the means of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Everybody got that? The only reason why you're going to be going to heaven is because you trust fully in Christ and what he did at the cross for you. Imagine that. That truth transforms. But the fact remains. The thief on the cross had no time to be able to show the world a transformed lifestyle. He was going to be dying in a matter of minutes or in an hour. But according to God, his Life was transformed by his faith that he placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Absolutely amazing. I want to remind you of this too as we conclude this chapter. If you remember way back, Socrates was writing to Plato and discussed, uh, with discussing man's sinfulness. And Socrates pondered the obvious when he said, it may be that the divinity can forgive sins, but I don't see how. Remarkable statement. Christ comes and fulfills the Old Testament scriptures that Socrates had, avail had available to him to read. Christ is the one who came and fulfilled. Third and final argument, church, verses 20 to 23, it's this. Having a life worth living is having the freedom of God. Will you write that down? The freedom of God. We need to hear this today. My goodness. So I, having the freedom of God. I don't want to upset anybody, but when you have the freedom of God, you have the, you're, you're liberated when you have the freedom of God. You're liberated from from doubts, you're liberated from fears, you're liberated from tyranny, from intimidation, be it physical or spiritual. Are you hearing me? Yes. Broke my heart last night. Lisa and I got in very late last night uh, from uh, Idaho. I was speaking up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, and so many young people on the plane and walking in fear. They were masked up. They were terrified. Uh, somebody coughed on the plane and I watched this one guy, this one guy, he was, he was physically bothered by someone coughing. By the way, the guy coughed. He wasn't coughing. He went, <coughs> and the guy, and he pulled it, he made his mask tighter. Look, look, I'm not gonna get into the science of how masks do not work. I'm not going to talk about that right now. 
I'm going to talk about, please don't allow yourself to be gripped by such a fear, but I could die. That's the point. That's the point to the gospel. Hello, you're going to die. Hey, everybody, cheer up. Say it with me. You're going to die. Listen, that's why Jesus came. We're all going to die. What, listen, what we're in the business of heaven is for this. Where are you going after you die? Because you could be fully vaxxed, fully masked, step outside of the airport and get hit by a taxi. Where are you going when you die? Do you trust Christ? And are you walking in that freedom, the freedom of God? And so we see it this way. We have freedom from our sentence. Our sentence or what has been our sin in life. It's hard for us to face this. This, this, the Bible is all about truth. And so we must be all about truth. It says in verse 20, for when you were slaves of sin, that means that you were bound and you had to do what sin said to do. And you say, well, Jack, what does that mean? You know, the, the, when the temptation came into your heart or in your mind and you thought about it, you went for it. You had no power to resist it. In fact, you even approved of it. You even said to others, hey, you want to come with me as I go do this? Sin? And I know you didn't say it that way, and I didn't say it that way, but hey, you guys want to come? We're going to go. Oh, yeah, sure, let's go. And the more, the merrier because of this reason. If you did it by yourself, you feel a little bit uh, the sting of conviction. But if you can get three, four, five, ten people to do it with you, oh, it takes the edge off, right? The more people you can get to pile on that thing that you're doing, then it takes the edge off. You say, well, how do you know? Because you know, and I know this, everybody's doing it. You ever heard that before? That's where it comes from, piling on. Somebody gets some harebrained idea. Hey, let's do this. Let's go vandalize things. No, that's not a good idea. Oh, come on. Everybody's doing it. And what they think is liberty leads to bondage. Sin will do that to you. We've talked about that at length. He says, though, listen, this is interesting, amazing logic by the Apostle Paul. For when you were slaves of sin, so you're tied to sin, you're shackled to sin, you have no freedom to get away from it. He says you were free in regard of, uh, to righteousness. It means this, you couldn't do anything right. So first he insults you in the front end of the verse, and then he stabs you at the latter end of the verse. You were bound to sin, you're tied to it, chained to it, that's without Jesus, and uh, then on top of it, you had absolutely no power or no regard or you had no uh, freedom to exercise righteousness because everything that you and I did without Jesus was wrong. This is tough stuff, people, but it's absolutely true and necessary for us to understand salvation and to live a life that's worth having. Verse 21 says, what fruit did you have then in these things or in the things of which you are now ashamed? Can you guys all circle the word ashamed? This is important. Do not raise your hand when I ask this question. Don't raise your hand, we don't need to see it. But you would ask yourself today, am I a follower of Jesus Christ? So heaven is open, the doors open to those who are followers of Christ. Question to you, are you a follower of Christ? Only you answer that to yourself inside, internally, and then ask yourself this. Regarding your past life and the things of your past life, are you ashamed of them? Don't answer. Are you ashamed of them? Ashamed meaning you turn, it's to turn away. Have you ever seen those cute videos or Instagrams where the dog tore up the kitchen? or the pillows, right? And the dad, the mom or the dad comes home. The mom or the dad. The owner comes home <laughs> and says, Roscoe, did you do this? And the dog goes. <laughs> have you seen that? By the way, have you noticed when a cat does something? <laughs> Lucifer, did you do this? <laughs> right? There's lessons in this. 
So the dog can't even look at you. That's the meaning of this word. To be ashamed, you just turn your face away. Can you imagine when Jesus shows up and if you're not covered by the blood of Christ in salvation, God's going to look at you and your face, you're going to try to put your face somewhere. The Bible says, watch out, walk with them for it's God's will that you not be ashamed at his coming. Isn't that amazing? When you're walking with Jesus, you're not ashamed. We're not perfect. We mess up all the time, but we hate it. But we're looking forward to his coming. When people say, oh, Lord, Jesus, come back, it doesn't mean that they've deluded themselves into thinking they're perfect. It means they know how big of a wretched sinner they are, even in the thought lives that they have. Oh, God, forgive me of that. God, home, I think... I don't know, I, I get up at 2.30 on Sunday mornings, you already know that, but I, but I usually go to bed you know, before eight o'clock at night. Well, I got home last night from the airport, it's close to 11 o'clock, and I'm trying to do the math, and it's like, it ain't good. <laughs> so by the time we get out of the airport, I'm thinking, truly, Lord, if this truck can go 80, I know you can too, Jesus. <laughs> now, that's wrong thinking. But our situations in our lives, we seek to justify those moments. And it's wrong. We can do or attempt to do something. But if we are not a child of the living God and we have a heart on fire for Jesus, then even what we do, act and decide or say it can be wrong. It's a tremendous thing. I'm going to um, uh, give you this. I'm going to ask you to write these things down. Uh, when it says that we are free in regard to righteousness, it means that we had no ability whatsoever to do anything good enough to please or to satisfy God. Absolutely zero. And I know that's offensive to the person who's bound in religion. Uh, hang on to your seats. You guys ready? All seven of you are ready. This is great. <laughs> We're going to go to the screen on this. Number one, watch this. And, and I got to give you this because it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you want to hug. Verse 22, when we get to it. First thing is this. Sin in us is the incurable root cause to or of our nature. You need to know that. Jeremiah 13 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. The heart, look at uh, Jeremiah 17, 9, says the heart is deceitfully uh, above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. This is what the Bible says about our hearts. And he says right now, right from the get-go, your nature cannot change under your own power. Can an Ethiopian change his skin color and can a leopard change its spots? The answer, the Bible says, is no. Well, the Bible also says our hearts are desperately wicked. And that's, I mean, that's a strong cup of coffee, right? But you know it's true. Just look at little kids. Watch them. They're cute. That's why God made them cute, because they're (laughs) wicked little stinkers. Stealing from one another, pillaging each other's toy box and stuff. I remember Dr. James Dobson said, which by the way, we were very honored, bumped into Dr. James Dobson and he said, Jack, I watch every Sunday morning from Palm Springs. Isn't that precious? What a sweet, precious man. And back in the day when we were raising kids, we had, the, we had 10 commandments. Back then, it was, we actually had them in stone. It was so far back then. And there was something called homeschooling that people thought was illegal back then. And Lisa was homeschooling. I'd come home and do some science with the kids. And uh, we had no parent, uh, no parent up uh, books or manuals to help us but Dr. James Dobson. And it was like, wow. And Dr. Dobson pointed out, he said, you should be very grateful that your two-year-old has very poor motor skills (laughs) because they're so bound by their emotional development that the body skill, thank God, doesn't match their emotional passion because in one moment, they love you and the next moment, they would kill you if they had the opportunity, if they could. (laughs) And then the next moment, they would love you. And so he points out, it's a great thing. They don't have control of their motor skills. 
because they would be like little Tasmanian devils running around <laughs> all over the place. Why? It's in the heart. That's our nature. Our nature needs to be changed. Secondly, sin in us is the root cause of rebellion. Did you know that? Where does rebellion come from? Where, with all the stuff you're seeing in our world today of evil and danger and ugliness and illogic and wrong and lovelessness, where does that come from? The Bible says rebellion. 1 Samuel 15 verse 23 says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Wow. Nobody would ever say Oh, I'm, I'm practicing witchcraft. That's no way. That's wrong. But the Bible says rebellion to God is the same as witchcraft. Isn't that amazing? And stubbornness is as iniquity as idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. That was the word given to Saul. Next, sin in us is the root cause of wickedness. This is where it comes from. By the way, those of you who are in college, in school, you ought to be writing this stuff down because if you ever have a debate class or if somebody ever asks you, hey, so you're a Christian? Well, why do bad things happen? Well, I'm giving you some of the answers right here, right now. Our nature has fallen. We are natural rebels against God. It's within our hearts. And when we exercise that, it's called wickedness. Genesis chapter six, verse five says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. That's Genesis 6. That's not today. <laughs> wow. And that every intent of the thoughts of, the, of his heart was only evil continually. Wow. And the Lord was sorry. The word sorry doesn't mean, oh boy, did I make a mistake. The word means grieved to the core. It, means, it, it technically means that God's head hung down. Now, did he know that they were going to sin? Yes, he did. But he went through it all, the Bible says, because when it's all over in eternity, God will receive the glory of having redeemed those who were lost, condemned. And the Bible goes on to there say in Genesis 6, verse 6, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. How sad. Next, sin in us is the root cause of defilement. Defilement. Uh, defilement in all kinds of ways, morally, uh, certainly. But there's a manifestation. I hate to bring this up, people, but it is a true uh, thing today. You can witness it uh, Anywhere, when a person gives up on having a relationship with God, they often sink down into a place of defilement. It starts out rel relatively uh, nondescript, not easy to detect. If they continue on that path, God, listen, God lets them go. If they're knocking on the fence, right? They're just pounding on the fence. You know what God does? God basically, without asking them, opens up, the, not, not, knocks the fence down for them because that's what they want. They want the fence down. Are you hearing me? Imagine the people when Noah's preaching. The Bible says he preached the gospel for 120 years. Noah, get in the boat. Get in the boat. And the Bible says they're all laughing at him. There had to be an amazing moment. They're all laughing, carrying on. It was a horrific defilement in the land, human sacrifice. They celebrated it. All of these things were going on, men's hearts and minds and their intent were constantly evil. Noah's preaching the gospel. Get in the ark, get in the ark. And then God tells Noah, get your family in, get in the boat. And they get in. And this is the most awesome thing of all. The Bible says that God, not Noah, God shut the door. Can you imagine Noah watching watch this? And this massive. <laughs> Can you imagine on the outside? Hey, Noah, quit goofing around. We were just kidding. And then clouds start to form because the Bible says it had not yet rained on the earth in those days. Can you imagine? What's that stuff? What is that, what is that hanging in the sky? It started to rain. The ground began to quake. 
and split open and water came out. By the way, you know what's fun about this? Hydrology, those of you who've studied hydrology, there's more water under earth that's not visible than water that is above the earth visible. How cool is that? I just wish we had some of it here. Although it did rain, I heard. That's awesome. While I was away, it rained. But we'll take it, right? Thank God for every drop. Defilement. Sin is a root cause of defilement. Titus chapter 1 Verse 15 says, to the pure, all things are pure. Think this through, everybody. Listen up. Wake up. To the pure, all things are pure. When God's got a hold of your heart, you can see the most horrific situation, and God will speak to you. Go be a minister of opportunity to these people for this situation. This little kid's being abused in this family. God speaks to you. Go rescue them. And that situation, you become a rescuer to them. Whatever it might be. Somebody sees, somebody sees something and they go, isn't that beautiful? A couple of days ago, when it was actually a, some puffy clouds in the sky, I was in the backyard and I knocked on the window and I said to Lisa, come out here. And she comes out and she goes, what? I go, what is that? I knew what it was. I go, what is that? She goes, it's a poodle. <laughs> and it was a cloud going by, and it was a perfect poodle. And it was, and she was correct, because I knew it was a poodle before I even asked her. So when I asked her, she said, it's a poodle. I said, you are correct. <laughs> but what's it doing? And then we watched in a matter of a minute, that poodle turned into look like a greyhound race dog, you know? We didn't look at the cloud and say, what does that look like? Oh, man, it looks like... You know what I'm saying? There's some people that look at stuff and have that, they have a filthy response. Did you hear that? Oh, oh wow, that reminds me. Oh, oh, gosh, please, put a lid on it. You know people like that? Everything to them. Look, look at the next part of that verse in Titus 1.15. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and their conscience are defiled. Filthy thinkers dirty jokes, everything's nasty. A heart and a mind that is evidence that God is not in it. They profess to know God, but in their works, they deny him by how they live. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified from every good or approved work. Lifestyle, remarkable. You guys okay? Yes. Just hang on, it gets better in the end. It gets, in the end, I said it gets better. Sin in us is the root all, all cause or root cause of our demise as humanity. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. He gave them the mind that they had nurtured. They put this in their mind. They loved it. And God kept saying, you need to get your mind clean. You need to get your mind washed. And they said, No. And like Pharaoh, they said no so often that God said, okay, all right. You want it, you can have it. To do those things which are not fitting, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whispers. This is tough reading. Backbiters, haters of God, violent Proud, boasters, inventor of evil things. Wow. Disobedient to parents. Undiscerning. Untrustworthy. Unloving. Unforgiving. Unmerciful. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also repost, retweet, approve of, those who practice them. <laughs> Strong stuff, right? All true. Sin is in us the root cause of our enslavement. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you he made alive. He's speaking to the believer. You today, my friend, if you're a follower of Christ. He's made you alive. But look at this. Who were, uh, who were dead or who were once dead, speaking of our previous life, 
in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Everybody's doing that. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's a reference title to none other than Satan. Did you know that? Wow. So I'm not serving Satan. Are you serving the Lord? No. Well, then you're serving Satan. That's what God's Bible says. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Wow. Sin is the root cause of a cursed life. 1 Corinthians 5. Okay, hang on to your seats. This is, listen, it's hard to find a good church. It's never, that problem has always existed because let me tell you, if you and I lived in Greece and if we lived in the city of Corinth, the church that Paul wrote this letter to, you and I wouldn't go there. You say, well, it's a church in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a church in the Bible getting rebuked. You don't want to be... Where do you go? Oh, I'm, the, I'm a member of the first, first Corinthian Baptocostal <laughs> church. Listen to this. This is 2,000 years ago, Paul. Writing, it's going to sound like in a moment, like I'm reading something like, I don't know, Judge Judy or, or I don't know. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind, a sort, that is not tolerated even among pagans. What is it? For a man, he's talking to the church, for a man, that's a man in the church, has his father's wife, stepmother. There's a, there's a, there's a young man with his stepmother, you know what I mean, wrestling. And you are arrogant. I'll tell you why in a second. And you are arrogant. Ought you ought not to mourn? Do you know what they were saying? The Corinthians were saying, yeah, we know about it. Isn't God's grace amazing? We are, listen, I kid you not, everybody listen up. Their word was, we are the most gracious church. Listen, listen, come as you are. All are welcome. Sounds good, right? By the way, in this church, come as you are. All are welcome, listen, to find out that we all need to be changed by Jesus. But when you say, come on in, all are welcome, we love you just as you are, and you leave people just where they're at, that's a false gospel. That ain't church. That's, listen, Jesus died on the cross to change us. So they boasted about it. We're the most gracious church in all of Greece. That wasn't a badge of honor. They were tolerant of evil things. He says, I'm not you to mourn. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Boot him out of the church. For the, listen, for though absent in body, I am present in spirit, says Paul, as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such thing. Verse four, this is a shocker. We're talking to Christians now, and this is a heavy When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, verse five, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, his body, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That's called church discipline. You're sleeping around, you're doing things, then you claim to be a believer. Paul says, the apostle, Paul says to this church today, Paul, that truth is God's truth. That's not Paul's truth, it's God's truth. And God's truth says this. Listen, you're a believer, but you're not living for me. In fact, you're in sexual immorality and you're out. We love you, we're weeping, get out. Why would you do that? He said so. So Satan would destroy your body. So listen, everybody, how saved can somebody be? The Bible says this guy's living in sin. Kick him out of the church so Satan kills him so that his soul may be delivered in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. You haven't read that passage in a long time, have you? But I want to emphasize this, emphasize this, that 
You can live a life as a believer that's not pleasing to God in such a way and it, it can be an, a, a, a cursed life and you don't want to do that. There's some, there's some Christians that are going to heaven and they're, they're allowing sin to control them and they're miserable. You are miserable. You know why you're miserable? Because you're saved. If you weren't saved, you'd be happy about what you're doing, right? Does this make sense? Oh, I'm going to get letters now from people who are saying, how could you say such a thing? They're all going to hell, Jack. You should have told them. You're going to burn. I can't say that. Paul the Apostle said, let Satan tear that guy's body up by disease, murder, uh, getting run over by a donkey. I don't know what was going to happen. Somehow the guy's life was going to be cursed without God's protection anymore. And the outcome was so that his soul is saved when Christ comes. That's what the Bible says. I'm not condoning sin. I'm just telling you this. Apparently, you can be so saved that when you step out of line, God removes his hand of blessing from you and your life is cursed. That's powerful stuff. One more. Sin in us is the root cause of man's damnation. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. Anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Have you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior? Is your name there? The Bible says, if you're trusting Christ to have died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again from the dead exactly as it happened and as it was prophesied, you lean on him, you trust him, that truth transforms your life from the outside. That word hits your ears, goes inside of you. The Holy Spirit goes to work and he transforms you from the inside out. When that happens, you can be rest assured of this. Your name is written down in heaven. But what if your name is not in heaven? The Bible says you'll be cast into the lake of fire, the Bible announces. In Revelation 21, verse 8, who's there? Who's in that spot? The cowards are there. Think of that for a moment, cowardly. Number one on the list. Don't you think number one on the list in hell it would be what, like rapist or child molesters? I don't know. Isn't it bizarre that the Bible has at the top of the list first, for those who inherit hell are cowards. Wow. The unbelieving the vile, the murders, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, that's um, sorcery, um, dark, demonic. I know this sounds silly to some people, but uh, don't think for a moment Ouija boards or toys. It may, it may be, a, it may be who, I don't know, Milton Bradley, whoever builds the thing and sells it, that's not the, that's not the point. There's certain things, there's, there's certain types of Things. Some of them are figurines, icons, uh, statues. There's certain things. I don't have the man. If I had the time to share with you guys today the stuff that we as pastors have seen happen in these last thirty years, number one, you wouldn't believe us. Number two, you'd, you'd probably say, oh, "I don't know if I signed up for that." Things where there's no human explanation. When you get called to a home and something like this or that or the other thing's going on, it's like, what in the world? Dark arts. Idolaters and liars. They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning, of burning sulfur. This is called the second death. And verse 21 says, what fruit... Did you have then in these things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Because the truth is this, my friend. Listen, we're almost done. No, we're not. <laughs> sort of maybe. The human, we're designed to, we're, we're designed to be mastered. You say, I don't like the way that, that sounds, well, it depends on who your master is. But you all know we don't do well on our own. We, 
we're designed to have someone over us. That's God's structure. And he's built a model. I'm not asking you to get a warm, fuzzy feeling about it or judge it up against this culture as a standard. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. God is the head and the church is his body. Think about it. The body can't go anywhere without a head. But the head can't accomplish anything without a body. God has chosen to link himself with us. And then Paul turns around and says, yeah, you know what? Just like a husband is head of the wife. She's the body and he's the head. That's supposed to be a good thing. When there's biblical masculinity leading, that woman says, honey, you can do whatever you want to do, babe. I know you love me with all your heart. You want to go there? You want to do, want to fly? You want to sit? Want to ride the bike? You want to eat liver and onions? You want, what? That was Lisa and I's big thing. I love it. I, I love it. I know, but she loves me, so. Um, but you hear what I'm saying? When Christian men decide to obey God in this model that God created, that he lives out with the church and himself, then the world is going to have to take notice of us men and the homes that we create. By no means what I'm saying is chauvinistic whatsoever. I think chauvinism as it is understood is sickening. Machoism is insane. Biblical masculinity is missing. And when a man leads the way Jesus would have us to lead, then we lay down our lives first for our wives and our family. We die first. Can you imagine? Somebody's at the door. We're going to break down this door. We're going to kill all of you inside there. Can you imagine the man saying, can you just hang on a minute? And he runs out the backsliding door, leaves the house to his Wife and kids, are you kidding? When the world comes knocking on the door, it's the man that's supposed to answer the door. (laughs) We've been designed that way. God has given us supernatural powers. I've got to share this verse. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You know it well. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you that you give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him, verse two. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what uh, is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, Running out of time, but I want you to see this. DARPA. Some of you know DARPA. If you don't know DARPA, uh, you don't. If you do, it's, it's insane. Uh, but your microwave, um, your internet, so much of what you have in life came out of DARPA. And so this is, this is currently, you can go to YouTube, not now after service. You can go to YouTube and watch this. This is uh, DARPA's development for the U.S. Army of the exoskeleton soldier. Uh, the, the 21st century uh, soldier, he puts himself, he straps that up part area over his shoulders, straps it onto his legs. The, the, the technology, technology of this is top, top secret. You, you strap that onto your body, talk about being transformed. They, ha- they have an 800 pound, 800 pound block. 800 pounds. And you try to pick it up. Can you pick up an 800 pound block? The guy puts that suit on, puts that skeleton on, walks over to it, picks it up, starts to walk with it. They put a 100-pound backpack on him with his rifle and gear with this, and he runs up a mountain. Runs. What do they do? They have developed a skeleton for us that's on the outside of our body but it is built with materials and it's geared at every movable joint in such a way 
that when it goes down, it loads up, it generates strength, and when it moves the other way, it releases that power. It's almost like a super battery inside these joints, okay? You say, well, that's cool. My point is, if man can do that, can't God do that to you on the inside? The answer to that is absolutely yes. Yes, he can. Verse 22 says, but now having been, listen to this, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and in the end, everlasting life. I want to just study the rest of this because we're out of time. Let's just go to the screens, you guys, on this. Go to the next slide. And so watch this. This is what you're reading. Number one, but now having been set free from sin. You heard that, right? True or false? It's true. The question is, is it true in my life? As a church, we need to do everything by yielding to the Spirit of God to make sure that you and I are living in that freedom. Number two, notice, having become. So number one is having been set free. Number two is having become slaves of God. Number three, you have your fruit to holiness. It means wherever you go, Christian, listen, wherever you go, people should be affected by mercy, grace, right? Gentleness, kindness. All of us, no matter, even though we look different, all of us look different. There should be a manifestation of reality that when the world looks at us, they say what they said 2,000 years ago. And it was this, we could tell that they had been with Jesus. Yes. Number four, and in the end, everlasting life. Watch, one, two, and three do not equal four. You don't do one, two, and three and get four. Does that make sense? You don't earn it. This is the reality of the believer. It's very simple, very, very simple. And then finally, we end in verse 23 in the sets, fact that we are free from debt. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, we all know this is true. This is amazing. The wages of sin is death. It's, it's true. It's just flat out true. You do the wrong thing, it's going to catch up to you. Well, nobody's caught me yet. You haven't been caught yet. You will get caught. Well, I, how, can, how is that possible? No, not, nobody sees anything. You know what? Nobody has to see anything. God says this in Numbers, I think, forgive me, I'm going from memory. It's either Numbers 32, 23, or 23, 32. I get my, can't remember what it was, but it means that the scripture says this. Be sure of this. It implies if you don't repent, by the way. Watch this. Can you imagine, hypothetically? So Rocky is sleeping with bubbles. They both claim to be believers, but they're not. They're fornicating. Or Rocky is married to Susie and Bubbles is married to Fred. They're together and they're having an adulterous relationship. Okay? God speaks to them and convicts them. They yield their lives to Christ. They say to one another, what we have done is wrong and sin against God. Goodbye. Goodbye. Listen, that scenario is kept contained by God. If somebody persists in living like that, watch where I'm going. That scripture in the book of Numbers says this, be sure of this. If you don't repent, be sure of this. Your sin will find you out. Do you know what that word means? Jesus said it in the New Testament. Whatever you've thought or done, without his blood covering your sin, Whatever you've thought or done, it's going to be shouted from the rooftops. Hey! Bubbles and Rocky! Busted! God wants you to repent. He doesn't want the world to know. But if you keep holding back, if you keep holding out, God just blows the whistle eventually because you're not listening. I want to end this message today with a really weird illustration. I confess, it's really weird. You guys can stand, by the way. It's really weird. So our flight was delayed, and there's all kinds of 
crazy stuff going on. So we're camping at the airport yesterday. And so I'm looking out the window and the first picture is just, that's my junk. I got my Bible there, writing down notes for today. And I saw this bee go by, it caught my attention, not inside the airport, outside the airport. And you know me, I'm distracted by myself. <laughs> and so I'm studying the Bible, as you can see, there's my Bible. That's not my purse, that's Lisa's <laughs> purse. And I see this bee go by and go to the next. Do you see him moving? Look at him, he's trying to get out. See down below, way down below, that's another bee, but it's dead. That's exactly what I did. I went, oh, and I thought, and here's what, I wanted to, I wanted to figure out how to get through that glass. And I'm thinking, there's just no way for me to get through that glass. So, I don't know, I'm sorry if I offend you with this, but I'm saying, Lord, help that guy. He's trying to get out, and he's trying to get out. Look at him. You know what? Then go to the next slide. Exactly. What happened? Listen, he thought he was flying around minding his own business. He had no idea that what he was about to get into was a web. A couple of times he fell and almost got out. But he didn't. In fact, the more he struggled, the more he got bound up in it. And what I was shocked is what I thought it would take hours for him to die or get free. That whole event took place less than 10 minutes and he was dead. And I said, Lord, that is such a perfect example of the way this world is. It's got, we're flying around, everything's fine. It's all great and dandy and, and it's cool. And, and all of a sudden you get a little bit caught up in this and then try to get it off your hand. And then now it's on your hand, you get off your foot and now it's on your foot. And now you try to just spin your way out of it and he just spun himself right into it. Know this, Christian, it's time for you today to get up and to walk in and to do the freedom that God has given you. You never again need to be entangled by any web ever again. You need to look at these verses and say, I'm free and I'm gonna live like it now in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you.